I'm delighted to be joined by Jared Ludlow uh, to talk about the Apocrypha today, but it's it's kind of relationship to us as Latter Day Saints. Um, so thank you for coming on, Jared, and I appreciate it. And I guess I would start by asking, where does this name, the Apocrypha, comes from? It I, immediately it rings bells of um, apocalypse and you know things like that, but. But uh, why is it called the Apocrypha? Yeah, like, that's a good question. Like the Apocalypse, it comes from a Greek word, Apocrypha. But here we're actually doing the opposite. Apocalypse technically means something that's uncovered or revealed. And Apocrypha has a sense of kind of covering up. Um, And anciently, uh, as this term was applied to certain texts, it depends on whether you view them positively or negatively. If they're positive texts, then sometimes you're covering them up because they're precious, they're sacred. Uh, So it's kind of like the pearls before the swine concept. But if you're negatively viewing them, then you're covering them up because they should be forgotten, discarded or whatever. And, And so various religious thinkers and and groups throughout time have approached these texts and made that determination do we include them or do we not include them and and as we'll probably talk about later joseph smith had a similar question when it came to the joseph smith translation um, in his bible that he was using for that project it had a section called the apocrypha and so he asked the Lord if he should translate or, you know, work through uh, that with the Joseph Smith Translation Project like he had the other books. And we have section 91 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's the Lord's response that basically says, no, you don't need to um, include those. But in that revelation, he also says there's good things in them and they can be read for profit and and learning and so forth. Uh, But there's also things of men. The problem was that the Lord didn't say which was which. (laughs) And so so he didn't um, include them as part of the Joseph Smith translation. And as far as I know, that's probably the reason why they're not part of the Latter-day Saint canon. Uh, You know, there was never a formal discussion that I've seen among early church leaders or in the general conference where they opposed the Apocrypha. Um, I think it just stemmed from this notion that um, they weren't part of the Joseph Smith Translation Project, so therefore we're not going to include them in our canon. That may be a carryover to a little bit of following a lot of the Protestant tradition that they tended to accept them much less than the Catholic or Orthodox Christian tradition. Right. So so when you say the Apocrypha was included in his version of the Bible, what do you mean by the Apocrypha? Because there, there are different types, right? Is, is there a an accepted version of the Apocrypha? Or, or is it just many, many apocryphal writings that, you know, some have and some don't? Uh, what actually is it? <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, yeah, probably it's helpful to to distinguish between capital A apocrypha as a noun and a p- adjectival sense that you mentioned apocryphal, uh, small a, because you're right. There's a lot of apocryphal texts uh, that exist, um, but usually when we're talking about the apocrypha, we're talking of those books that when the ancient Jews decided to translate the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament into Greek, what we call the Septuagint, they had additional books that were in the Greek version that were not in uh, the Hebrew version. And some variations of those books, like a new version of Esther and some additional stories of Daniel. Anyway, um, it's It varies a bit by denominations, but there's basically about 15 books that are commonly considered part of the Apocrypha. 
and some will add an additional texture to um, one that's commonly found in the Apocrypha. There's one that's found in the Apocrypha that's not from the Greek Septuagint, but was in old Latin uh, versions of the Bible. And so they will sometimes include that. And so it is kind of a defined set of books that are the Apocrypha. And so um, another denominational difference is the Catholics and Orthodox Christians usually would intersperse these 15 or so books throughout their Bibles, basically where they would end up chronologically. And, and by Bibles, I guess I'm saying just the Old Testament. The New Testament has a whole bunch of other apocryphal texts associated with it. Um, you know, additional gospels and acts of the apostles and, and these sorts of things. But we're just focusing on the Old Testament when we talk about the Apocrypha, because that's what the Septuagint um, was. And in, um, in the, like I said, in the Catholic or Orthodox Bibles, you know, if they have additional stories of Daniel, well, then, of course, they'll be attached with the book of Daniel. Or the new version of Esther will be where the book of Esther is usually found. Um, and then they'll put in, like, there's two books of Maccabees uh, that are usually part of it. There are actually additional third and fourth Maccabees and so forth. But um, those would often be at the very end because chronologically they come from, uh, you know, the second century B.C. And so that's kind of where it fits. The Protestants, however... Um, if they did accept the Apocrypha, or they even had a funny kind of thing where they would often be kind of required to print them, these books, even if they didn't accept them. And so they would just put them in a section usually at the end of the Old Testament, so between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that was the case in Joseph Smith's Bible, that he came to the section of the Apocrypha and then ask the Lord what he should do uh, with this. There's even some print, Protestant printers that would print them, but then wouldn't bind them with the rest of the book. So it's, it's kind of a funny uh, thing that they would do with. And the, you can look through different uh, faith statements of different Protestant groups, and some will, will say that they're worth reading, they're edifying, but they're not authoritative. And, and that's usually, you know, where they land is they just can't be used to determine doctrine or practice. But, you know, they can be inspiring or edifying. And, and to be honest, that's kind of where I think Latter-day Saints, or at least early Latter-day Saints, ended up. Um, I think as time went on, Latter-day Saints have become less and less familiar with the Apocrypha. And so, you know. There's no real sense of what it for. Do you think that's a shame? Um, I th yes. I mean, I don't think everybody has to read the Apocrypha, but I think it it does shed light on um, certain time periods, particularly the Maccabees. This gives us a history of something we don't have in the Bible because. We have about a 400-year gap between Malachi and Matthew, mm -hmm. and this helps fill in a little bit of that. Uh, what I think could be helpful from the Apocrypha is a lot of the stories center around trying to live one's faith in a world that doesn't share your faith. And that's often, you know, our struggle too. How can we live our faith and be faithful to our covenants when the world is trying to pressure us to not do so. Now, thankfully, we're not under heavy persecution today, but a lot of them were to maintain their faith, uh, where it was even more um, vital that they had role models or strength they could draw on to maintain their faith when they were facing heavy persecution. So I think there's some lessons we could learn uh, from some of these stories. 
um, as well as just kind of they're some delightful tales, you know, and it's kind of fun to, to read them, just like we like reading some of the Bible stories and, and we get familiar with the characters and so forth. And so if you go to, you know, like museums with a lot of Christian art, you'll see a lot of depictions from the apocryphal, the, the stories in the apocrypha um, that, you know, if you're familiar with the story, then you can say, oh, well, that comes from Tobit or, you know, Susanna or whatever. Right. Uh, can you paint a picture of, of what role the apocrypha played in, in early Christianity um, compared to how... Christianity's general relationship with the Bible is today. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, first off, you know, just a reminder that these do start as Jewish texts. And, um, and so that's, you know, as Christians are <clears throat> coming out of Judaism, I would say, uh, you know, they, they accept Jesus as the Messiah, and that puts them on a different trajectory than other Jews, uh, but they still then wrestle with, well, what do we bring from our Jewish past and tradition and culture and so forth? And so we see some of the that the, those dilemmas in the New Testament. You know, Paul is dealing with, you know, what do we do with circumcision or eating kosher or these kinds of things? And, you know, certainly related to that would be, well, what books of Scripture do we bring with us and, and use. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the earliest Christians seem to accept these books from the Apocrypha uh, much more readily than the Protestants later on. And, and it's always hard to know if just that's part of Protestantism, you know, like if they have it, then we don't want to have it, <laughs> you know, and uh, or, you know, but, you know, Martin Luther and others would, would look at these texts and determine for themselves if they felt, thought they were worthwhile. Um, but I know particularly, again, coming back to that persecution issue, uh, you know, early Christians suffered a lot of persecution from the Romans. And some of the stories in Maccabees became kind of their story, like, to strengthen and bolster their faith. Um, and so, you know, I think they adopted a lot of the principles that show up in some of these books uh, for themselves. And, um, and some of the wisdom sayings and, and so forth, we have, you know, a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. We also have Ecclesiasticus or The Wisdom of Jesus Ben Sirah. Uh, is another book. And so, you know, they would, just like we can pull things from Proverbs or, or whatever, um, they did some of those similar things with some of those texts. Why might there be, say, the inclusion of Proverbs and not the inclusion of some of these then? You know, like, uh, how, in, in what other ways do the does the Apocrypha kind of differ from the canon that we do have? Um, I think one way is a lot of these texts, you can see the Greek influence. You know, the, this is post-Alexander the Great when many of these texts were written. Right. Even if they're put back into the time period, earlier, like in the Syrian context or Babylonian context. And so you see some of that Hellenized, Hellenized thought uh, portrayed and, and included uh, within them. And so, you know, some religious people felt uncomfortable that things were getting too Hellenized or too philosophical or something. And, and so some would resist a little bit, I think, some of those notions that you can find within some of the texts of the Apocrypha. Um, but again, because they're mostly tied to Old Testament figures or settings, uh, I think many probably didn't even 
dial into that very much, you know, just, hey, here's another story about Daniel. Great. Let's read it, you know. But if you look closely, you can see some of the influence there. And then, you know, one of the questions is, you know, yes, we see them kind of popping up first in the Septuagint. Presumably they had life before that, either as oral tradition or in other versions. Uh, and so, like, for example, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we do see some fragments, very fragmentary, but some fragments from, for example, the Book of Tobit. Uh, and so they included it among texts that they felt were worth copying and having in their library, so to speak. And, uh, <clears throat> and so even though it wasn't part of their canon. What's interesting is that even though these were written by Jews, ultimately the Jews decide not to include them later on in their canon. Uh, and so they become more of a Christian text from the first century AD on uh, than among the Jews. And it's only, I would say, in, among scholars today going back, trying to mine these texts except for the Maccabees, of course. Maccabees, the stories there at least continue because that's the foundation of the celebration of Hanukkah, for example. Uh, that's not an Old Testament festival. That's found in the book of Maccabees. Um, and so they continue some of these stories, uh, but they never included them in their canon. Their Hebrew Bible ended at Malachi, you know, um, well, it's different ordering in their text, but uh, included up to that time period of Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi, and so forth. So these these books that you mentioned, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there, and I'm I was just watching something the other day about, say, again, New Testament, but the Gospel of Judas and how it was rediscovered in like 2006 or something sometime really recently was that collection the apocrypha was that always quite well preserved and passed down through those periods of protestantism and, and from earlier times was there any need for parts to be uh, rediscovered or or adding on to the apocrypha yeah no uh, as far as i know they it once it showed up in the septuagint and again there's various Greek translations of the that we call Septuagint. Um, so there's kind of different versions, if you will, just like we have many different English versions of the text. Um, but those kind of, I think, consistently passed on. And so the earliest codices, you know, um, where we had the entire Old Testament, New Testament, um, I believe both of them, the Sinaiticus and the, and the Codex Vaticanus, that both date around 400 AD, um, included apocrypha, the books from the Apocrypha in them, but again, interspersed. And so it kind of solidified as part of the tradition. And so the Protestants had to make a conscious choice what, what they were going to do with it. The Jews had decided in the first century, no, we're not going to have them as part of our canon. Uh, Protestants then, 1,400 years later, kind of make a similar uh, determination, basically. But in between there, you know, there's, I think there is a continual transmission of, of these texts. They're, it's not like Gnostic Christian texts or something that suddenly were discovered in in Al Hamadi in Egypt or something, and these these were around and part of, and that's why I think you know, like I said, they show up in a lot of Renaissance art and other things, is because they're just that's part of their culture. It's what they were raised on, basically. Mm. So, with this, who actually wrote it? Who are the key writers? Uh, and you've mentioned the Maccabees a lot. Who are they? What are the? I've I've heard them and. You know, before I was, became familiar with the Apocrypha, there's a, a British band called the Maccabees that are quite popular over here. So <laughs> that was what I associated it with. Nice. Good. 
I have not heard of that band. Um, I do know that a lot of Israeli basketball teams are called the Maccabees. Oh, really? Um, yes. Uh, they have Tel Aviv Maccabees, Jerusalem Maccabees, and so forth. Because these are the warriors. These are the Jews that decided to uh, rebel against the Greeks that had come in and, and were their overlords. And so around 200 BC, one of the Greek rulers from Syria that kind of had control over the area of the Holy Land um, decided very unwisely to start um, putting strict restrictions on Jewish worship. And so that left a lot of Jews of that time period in this dilemma of, well, what do we do? Do we just stop practicing these things that we would want to practice? And do we allow him to put up idols in our temple? And, you know, do we stop circumcising our sons? Do we stop, you know, doing all these practices? And a family, uh, the, um, the father's name was Matthias, and he had five sons. Uh, they kind of lead this rebellion and saying, no, we're going to stand up against this and we're not going to allow these restrictions and they were able to you know coalesce others to to join them and and they start a uh, you know basically like i said a rebellion and the i think it's he's the fourth son his name was judas uh, but he went by the nickname Mac maccabeus Judas Maccabeus, and it comes from, it's a nickname for hammer. So he was the hammer. He was the, the tough guy uh, among them. And so it becomes known as the Maccabean Revolt in a lot of um, circles. And they just kind of lead this revolt, and, and they caught the, it's the Seleucids that are the Greek rulers from Syria. They caught them at kind of a weak point because they're worrying about territories in their eastern province and they, they didn't think this would be that big of a problem and so they didn't really address it strong enough and they were able to conquer some of the armies that were sent against them and particularly second maccabees points out a much more direct role of god helping them and angel forces angelic forces and things like that and anyway they were able to kind of reconquer Jerusalem and re-consecrate the temple that had been desecrated by some of these religious uh, changes. And that's really what Hanukkah celebrates. Um, Hanukkah means dedication, so the dedication of the temple. Oh. And they light the eight candles because as they, this isn't in actually in the book of Maccabees, but it's a story that comes a little bit later that, um, to, for the menorah, the candelabra in the temple, you needed to have special consecrated oil, but it was like a week process, a week long process to produce that oil. And they only had one day's worth and they kind of had this decision to make. Do we light it on the first day and then that's it and we'll wait till the other oil is done? Or do we wait a few days and then light it and then the other oil will continue from that point on. Well, they decided to go ahead and light it the first day, and then miraculously, according to the story, this oil continued for the eight days until they had the, the new oil ready. And so that's why they um, you know, light the, the menorah. Technically, it's called a Hanukkah, because if you look carefully at the temple, the candelabra has seven branches, whereas Hanukkah has eight, or sometimes nine. One is kind of the lighter candle that lights the others. Uh, so it's usually set out, off a little bit. So anyway, that's kind of where that came from. And, and so then they had about 100 years of basically semi-independence. They kind of worked out with the Greeks that they could continue to to rule, but kind of at 
the Greeks decided, well, we'll just let you kind of do that. But they were still the overlords, if you will. And that's called the Hasmoneans. And that, and that comes from the family name of Matthias. And so there's about 100 years of what we call the Hasmonean Empire or dynasty. And Herod marries one of the last of those Hasmoneans, Herod the Great, uh, to kind of give legitimacy to his claims. But then the Romans come in, I think it's 63 BC, and that, you know, kind of shuts down uh, the end of the Greek period. And, you know, under Herod, the end of the Hasmoneans, and then we have the Herodian period uh, that starts where he's a, a vassal king under the Romans, like kind of the Hasmoneans were a little bit under the, the Greeks. So this is all happening in between Malachi and when Jesus comes, essentially. Yeah. Right. Oh, interesting. Yep. And, and even, you know, I mean, most most of it is from 200 BC to, to about, you know, mid, you know, 50 BC or so. Right. It does make you wonder, given the historical nature of it and all of that, why, and the fact that we have this huge, something almost 500 year gap between the Old and New Testament, why they didn't just kind of continue it through even purely for historical context and there's got to be some benefit from it you know what i mean like that it seems quite strange yeah. to me that they would intentionally force that that gap um between the two testaments although i suppose if if you didn't have that then you wouldn't really have an old and new testament maybe because it would just be <laughs> one testament Blend yeah together yeah and, and a lot of it comes down again to the Greeks um, because it's in a different language. You know, the Jews kind of settled on, we'll stick with the Hebrew original kind of idea. And then the notion came, you know, prophecy ceased, uh, et cetera. Um, whereas, you know, those who accepted the Apocrypha, they were fine with, Greek language and some of the Greek influence and so forth. And so, you know, that's it's a kind of a, yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon how that all happened. And, and you'd asked the question earlier about who wrote it. And a lot of these books, we don't know, just like, you know, with the Bible, we don't, you know, who wrote first and second Samuel? Well, we don't really know. It's just kind of traditions or stories that were written and passed down. Um, and that's the case with a lot of the Apocrypha, um, except for we do have one that's named, um, I mentioned it before, Ecclesiasticus, or the Wisdom of Jesus ben Sira. And so Jesus ben Sira is a scribe in Jerusalem, and as part of his scribal training for his students, um, he would have them write these little wisdom sayings or, and things like that. So it's kind of practicing writing. Uh, and then his grandson decided to translate these into Greek. Um, so presumably these were first written out in Hebrew and, and so forth. And then his grandson comes along and, and kind of translates them. And, and so that's the only one that really... Uh, has an author attached to it and a translator in that case. Others like Wisdom of Solomon are claimed to be from Solomon and some potentially could have been, you know, again, oral traditions or something passed down to Solomon. But of course, even in our Old Testament, we say a lot comes from Solomon that maybe he actually didn't write or say, I don't know. There's, you know, additional uh things related to the book of jeremiah there's uh, baruch who's the scribe of jeremiah and so he has a book uh and the letter of jeremiah is a letter that jeremiah is purported to have written about you're going to start living in this new land of babylon and you're going to be tempted to worship these fancy gods and temples and shrines that they have and he's warning them, you know, against that. Um, 
Another one's called the prayer of Manasseh. And if you remember in the Old Testament, Manasseh is not a good guy. Um, in fact, he's usually uh, attributed to killing the prophet Isaiah. But in Chronicles, so he's mentioned in, you know, in the books of Kings, but he's also mentioned in the book of Chronicles, and he seems a little better in the book of Chronicles than he does in Kings. And so it's kind of raised some questions. Well, did he change or not? Well, we have a book called The Prayer of Manasseh where a very penitent Manasseh is praying to God for forgiveness for his previous wickedness and so mm-hmm. forth and um, so forth. So kind of an interesting, different approach to this character or this king. What are some of the other kind of most famous events or goings on or, or stories from the Apocrypha similar to that? Um, I think uh, I mentioned that there's some additional stories of Daniel. There's three. There's called the Song of the the Three Young Men. <clears throat> and if you remember, they have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are kind of their Babylonian yes. names. Um, they're thrown in the furnace. Well, this story tells a little bit more about what it was like in the furnace and why, really? you know, what happened to them and, and you know, the angelic figure that kind of helped them and, and so forth. And so uh, it's kind of like a, a, a psalm or something and, as well as a story of that episode in the furnace. Um there's a story of Susanna that's not really connected with the Book of Daniel specifically, except for Daniel as the main character. I don't want to spoil the entire story. It's a, it's a great story. But basically, two lustful elders um, are lusting after elders of the community, not you know, missionaries or anything, um, are lusting after this man's wife, Susanna, and they know that she bathes at a certain time in their garden every day and so they unbeknownst to each other initially linger after a meeting with her husband and try to hide in the garden to see her and when, once they see that each one has the same purpose they um, they kind of plot together to force her to lay with them, with them. but she resists and calls out and, and then it becomes this, well, who's right? Is, is, is Susanna, they claim that a young man came and, and they was, Susanna was lying with him or something. And anyway, uh, that's where Daniel enters the story and he's able to, to determine who is really guilty in this story and, and Susanna's innocence and so forth. Blimey. And somewhat, <laughs> somewhat similarly, there's a story called Bell and the Dragon. And this is where some of the Babylonians are claiming that their idol eats all the offerings that are left in front of it every night. And they're trying to get Daniel to acknowledge their God and worship him and so forth. But Daniel comes up with a plan. Um, kind of, some of these are considered like the early detective stories or whatever, Susanna and Bella and the Dragon, um, to, to expose that the priests and their families are actually sneaking into the temple at night and eating all the food and so forth. Uh, and so, so it, it continues, you know, the persona of Daniel as a very wise figure who's able to interpret and, you know, share revealed things, etc. Um, an interesting text in the Apocrypha that's often talked about is the additions to the book of Esther. Hmm. If you look at the Hebrew Bible version of Esther, which is basically the version we have in our Old Testament, it doesn't mention God. It it makes it sound like Esther and Mordecai, her uncle, are the ones that are able to save the people. Yes. And so some of the readers are like, well, wait, didn't God have a role in this? And so 
in the Septuagint version of the book of Esther, there's five places where there are additions made. So there really are like copy and paste, you know, chunks of text, not just a random verse here and there. And most of them highlight the role of God, highlight Esther's petitioning God and asking for help and, you know, and just gives a little more characterization to Esther and the feeling. The other issue is what's a good Jewish girl doing in a foreign king's harem? It doesn't seem to be any problem. And yet, you know, that's not how Jews operate normally. And so these additions address that issue as well. Some of her, you know, lamentations of having to do this and that, you know, why she feels she has to and, and these kinds of things. So it, it just shows kind of a later, what it does is it gives us a glimpse into some of the interpretive issues that they may have felt towards the book of Esther. And it tries to resolve them through this new, these additions, basically. It's really interesting, um, the, the kind of learning new uh, angles on people you already recognize from the Bible because we, we don't have so much about them in there. I, I never would have pictured Daniel from um, from what we know of him in the Old Testament as a kind of spiritual Sherlock Holmes going about and solving exactly. mysteries. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's what he does in some of these stories. And there's two other stories that are probably the most well-known from the Apocrypha, Tobit and Judith. And they don't really have connection to, I mean, they're not biblical figures, but they are, Tobit set in the Assyrian exile. Judith is during the time of the Babylonians. Um, and so basically they introduce new heroes through their stories and, you know, new figures that people could look up to. And, you know, having a female figure uh, that is a heroine in her story, you know, Judith, she's a by far the strongest character in the story and is able to bring down this Greek general who thinks, you know, he's on his way to Jerusalem to destroy the temple, he thinks. But she's able to, to trick him and and uh, ends up killing him. There's some interesting art about this where he's basically headless on his bed and she or her handmaiden is holding his head. Um <laughs> And putting it into a bag and carrying it back to her village to show the elders of her community what had happened and that gives them the strength to then defeat the army and so forth so some interesting stories definitely <laughs> what are some of the uh what are some of your favorite excerpts Has, have there been any in particular during your during your study of it that have stood out to you or perhaps have um perhaps have benefited your faith even, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, little things here and there, I would say. Um, you know, I do a lot of narrative work in my studies, and so I, I do like the, the way these stories are told um, in some of these tales. Um, I would say probably, as far as faith affirming, I think the Maccabees can be very faith affirming because, again, you know, we're taught to be in the world but not of the world. And so these Jews were really faced with that dilemma much stronger, meaning they could be put to death if they continued practicing the way that they had been. You know, and so it's caused me to think, well, how strong am I with the worldly influences around me? If I cave in on the simplest thing and say, well, I don't need to really worship on the Sabbath anymore, uh, you know, I'm far below what these uh, believers were. Um, whereas, you know, maybe I'm not having direct persecution, but can I rise above the worldly influences? Can I, you know, stand up in a, a function that where there's everybody's drinking and, 
and I'm not going to be drinking, you know. Um, will I be one that observes the Sabbath and, and says, well, no, I attend church on Sunday. You know, that's just what I do. Uh, even if others are saying, well, you know, let's go have a little holiday and, you know, go to the lake or something, you know. And so I think in some of those ways it can be uh, faith affirming to to see the example of some of these figures. And, and yes, some are more historical than others. Uh, but even then, I mean, if you look at the parables of Jesus, He's not necessarily telling historical stories when he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. He's telling us of characteristics we should develop like the people in the stories. And I think that's where a lot of the value can come is, you know, was there really Tobit and Tobias, his son, you know, um, maybe, but maybe not. But even if not, uh, what did they do to, to maintain their faith in a, um, a Gentile, if you will, environment of that day? And, and what can I do in my environment and so forth? Yeah, that, no, that's really interesting, that. And I, I wonder on that, well, I, well, actually, with your book, um, you chose to write a whole book on how Latter-day Saints can uh, can kind of, or, or their relationship with the Apocrypha. What, what was it that inspired you to, to write that book? Was it this kind of appreciation for its narrative and, and the these stories in there? Uh, that's definitely a starting point. I think there's also the recognition that we didn't have a whole lot written from a Latter-day Saint perspective. Right, I see. Uh, about the Apocrypha. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, I give firesides or presentations or, you know, BYU hosts an education week every year. And, and so I had started giving, because this is kind of my area of research is what we call Second Temple Judaism. Right. Um, you know, from the time of returning from the Babylonian exile until, you know, the end of the first century when the, Ro the Jerusalem Temple is destroyed by the Romans. That's where a lot of my research area is which overlaps with early Judaism and early Christianity, but it deals more in non-canonical texts like the Apocrypha uh, than necessarily in canonical, at least non-canonical from the Latter-day Saint perspective. Mm. Um, but so I, since I sometimes teach classes in that or do research, and I thought, well, maybe at Education Week, I'll do a series on the Apocrypha. And as I would do this, some people would say, well, is there a book about, you know, the Latter-day Saint perspective on the Apocrypha? And I'd say, no, but maybe I should try to write one. And, and so eventually, I think that was the impetus was, you know, people wanting to know more about it, but not sure where do we go to find out more about it? And, and is it, you know, it's always kind of a little helpful, I think, to first see it from your own faith perspective, you know, kind of background or whatever. And so what I did try to do is just it, it's really an introductory book. It's encouraging people if they want to, to read more, will go to the Apocrypha and read these texts themselves. Um, but at the end of each chapter, I did try to kind of, well, what can we apply from this, if you will, as Latter-day Saints, or how might this connect? There's some stories that connect with some of the, our Book of Mormon uh, stories and, and so forth. Um, and so that was kind of the, the impetus and just, you know, already liking this material, doing some research and teaching in it, but then having people say, well, where can I learn more or, or whatever? And so, so that's kind of what led me to, to write it. Well, it's a fantastic book. I would recommend it to everyone. It's, uh, I will link it in the description, actually, if, if people are interested to go there and, uh, Revisiting what you brought up at the start, um, Doctrine and Covenants 91, it is. Uh, in fact, I'll read that because it's very short. <laughs> Verily, yeah. thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha, there are many things contained therein that are true, 
and it is mostly translated correctly. There are many things contained therein that are not true, which are interpolations by the hands of men. Verily I say unto you that it is not needful that the Apocrypha should be translated. Therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand, for the Spirit manifesteth truth. And whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom, and whoso receiveth not by the Spirit cannot be benefited. Therefore, it is not needful that it should be translated. I, I find that really interesting. And I'm wondering what, in, in your mind, what can we learn from Joseph Smith's relationship with the Apocrypha, his study of it, uh, and how they used it in kind of early Latter-day Saint times? And also, I know this is becoming a very long question, but I'm interested to know if you know of any kind of more modern Latter-day Saint leaders who have referred to it or have spoken about it in in a way following this uh, section yeah it's it was interesting because i did try to you know do some historical study of how how was the apocrypha used in the early church and particularly um and you know, section 91 is, is key. That's where it kind of all starts and where we first see it come out. Uh, and I think what I see Joseph Smith saying here, or the Lord saying through Joseph Smith, I guess I should say, is again, the importance of the spirit, right? That anytime we're approaching scripture, the spirit is absolutely vital to learning what we can learn from that scripture uh and so you know verse four there it says therefore whoso readeth it let him understand for the spirit manifesteth truth and whoso is enlightened by the spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom and so you know whenever we approach scripture study with the spirit or as we start getting the spirit as we're doing our scripture study uh, we we have insights we have promptings we have sometimes questions answered we have we get motivation to do things and i think that's maybe what the point is of this section is if you're going to read these texts you need to, to do it with the spirit and find well what what relevance does it have to me what strength can i draw from it or inspiration because as verse six says whoso receiveth not by the spirit cannot be benefited you know, so, so I think that's something that um, is being shared here from section 91 is the importance of, of the spirit, not only as we approach the Apocrypha, but I would say with any scripture text. Um, and we don't see Joseph Smith preaching from the Apocrypha. Uh, in fact, I tried finding it and I never found a, a sermon or something that he gave that uh, he quoted from it. But we do get the Apocrypha showing up in early church periodicals. Sometimes they'll be quoting from it. Sometimes they'll be applying it or, or, or saying that some prophecies are fulfilled via the restoration uh, from some of these texts like in First Ezra's and, and others. Um, but I found it interesting. There's one little episode that happened where they were um, sealing the Nauvoo Temple's capstone, and they decided they wanted to put a Bible in there, kind of like a time box, or what do we call them? A time capsule. Anyway, time capsule, there we go. Something different. Anyway. The Bible that they had didn't have an apocrypha in it. And so, but they felt like, well, we probably should have one with the apocrypha in it. And so Reynolds Cahoon, who is famous in another church history episode for his son being blessed by Joseph Smith as Mahanrai Moriankamer Cahoon. <laughs> um, that's where we get the name of the brother of Jared, right? He went, he volunteered to go home and he rather than bringing his family Bible, he cut out the Apocrypha section and brought that section to be included in the capstone. Uh, and so while 
while it wasn't part of the canon, they felt like it was to have a complete Bible, they should have that uh, included in it. And so, it, like I said, it does show up in some of the early periodicals, um, occasional talks in general conference might reference something. I think the most recent, I think President Holland in one of his talks um, quoted a verse from one of the books in the Apocrypha, but um, yeah, it's, it's from Ecclesiasticus. He said, there's a line from the Apocrypha which puts the seriousness of this issue better than I can. It reads, the stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. So if maybe some remember that talk about the tongue and about evil speaking or or harshly speaking against others and and so he quoted there from Ecclesiasticus or the wisdom of Jesus Ben Sira. Um, so so obviously you know it's a resource that people could find little wisdom sayings or or figures that they could see as models um, but because it's not part of our canon, it's not part of our come follow me cycle or <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, so we, we just aren't as familiar with So there's it. not going to be a come follow me apocrypha. There's an exclusive there. <laughs> I doubt it. Not anytime soon. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, yes. you, you alluded to before about kind of how it relates to our doctrine. I, and... There's a really interesting question in there of, of ha, has anything from the Apocrypha influenced our doctrine? Or, or maybe a better thing to say would be, does it parallel anything we learn about in the Book of Mormon or, or the Standard Works or modern revelations that perhaps the Bible doesn't satisfy as much? Um. <clears throat> There's one section in the Maccabees that may be an example of this that some Protestants get uncomfortable with. And that is almost the sense that you can pray for and help people who've already died, who've already gone beyond the mm -hmm. mill. Now, there, it doesn't talk at all about baptisms for the dead or, or temple work or anything like that. But just that principle or that notion that you can do something in this mortal life that can have an effect and bless and help uh, the soul or spirit of somebody who's already passed on. Um, that's definitely Latter-day Saint uh, theology. And I don't think we really see that in the Old Testament. Um, you know, and so I think it, you know, while it's a kind of different thing on um, this, one hand it's the same principle and the other uh kind of idea um there's some interesting sayings about parenting if you will sometimes maybe a little rougher than today's society would allow <laughs> but but just the importance of of teaching and raising your children to in the covenants, you know, and to be faithful and, and those kinds of things. And, and certainly that's a major emphasis we have in the church, um, to do our best to help our children um, come to the Lord and, and stay on the path to the Lord. And, and so there may be some of that. that now, that's not unique to the Apocrypha, but it kind of may be encapsulated in certain sayings a little different than what we see is just general commands in the uh, Old Testament or something. Right. It's interesting what you were saying before about um, the how it was used in, in the early church or, or you know, um, their involvement with it. As you kind of see this, the first converts, the people who established the church being a obviously a scripture hungry people because a prime reason of why they joined this small uh, 
infant church in America, despite the hardship, was this promise of new scripture from God, new revelation, an ongoing canon. Therefore, you, I guess it kind of makes sense that that group of people would be particularly interested in reading and familiarizing themselves with whatever they could get hold of in terms of um, potential God's word. Um, and uh, and then you can contrast that with Elder Holland too, who will not contrast, compare it with Elder Holland, who is obviously a, a fantastic scholar, a literary of literary interest as well. So um, it is interesting to see that and align that with what you've said about using it as a resource. And I'm thinking of people now who are watching this thinking, I quite fancy reading that. Um, I would say, uh, being, you know, at a very beginner level myself, uh, entering it with your book and getting that background is very helpful. Um, and w would you have any further advice from people who then dive into the Apocrypha about how to approach, uh, a, uh, I don't know if study is the right word, but a, a reading of it, you know, just out of interest and, and supplementing their study with it? Yeah, I think, again, going to the primary source uh, and reading these texts, it's not very long. In fact, right. if you could indulge me, I'll just grab one oh, off. Yes. <clears throat> so if you took it out of the Bible, um, you would, it's about the size, sorry, I don't know if it's clear. No, no, or it's not. good. Uh, so it's, it's quite that thin, is. this particular version is, you know, the text itself, well, it, I, I was going to say it's not very long. It's 300 pages, but that's, I mean, it's not long. It's much shorter than the, the New Testament and certainly much shorter than the Old Testament. Um, but, the, but each book is, I guess I should say, is not very long. It's, you know, 10, 15 chapters or something. But you can easily access online or if you wanted to, to get something, um, what I would suggest is maybe getting an annotated or a study Bible version mm -hmm. like this one. This is the New Oxford Annotated Apocrypha. And the version that I've liked is the New Revised Standard Version, right. which now has an updated edition. So it's NRSV UE, if you do all the uh, abbreviations, but um, it, it gives just enough footnotes, I think, and some maps and, and some charts or whatever, that if you, you know, want a, a little more of the context or the what's going on here, um, I think that would be helpful uh, as well than just maybe just reading the text by itself, although I think for most of it, you would be able to follow along pretty, pretty well. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this has the normal list of books that are included in the Roman Catholic, the Greek, and the Slavonic Bibles, but they also show some that are just in the Greek and Slavonic Bibles, and then even um, some that are in an appendix to the Greek Bible and so forth. So all in all, I think this particular one has like 20 books, but usually it's around 15 that is the standard apocrypha. Right. Well, I am excited to dig into it uh, after this and have a proper read. Um, I've, as I said before, I've read some of the New Testament ones and they're pretty wild in themselves. Um, so, you mm -hmm. know, it sounds like these, the Old Testament one can be a bit more trusted, a bit more grounded um, in what it's saying and, you know, can benefit with uh, wisdom or things of, of the spiritual. Um, and well, I would say as a final word, uh, what would your one final message be to people listening to this about the Apocrypha? Um, a lot of people, probably their initial reaction is, well, if it's not in the canon, if it's not in our standard works, 
why should I read it or pay attention? Um, so my final word about that would be um, because it helps fill in, like we've mentioned, this gap of time. Um, it comes from a period that we don't have in our Bibles. Uh, so we can get, gain a little bit more knowledge there. Uh, but then, it, you know, it builds upon some of these Old Testament stories and figures and contexts. And so, you know, it'll, it'll just, I think, broaden a little bit our understanding. And I think, you know, looking for ways that we can learn from these stories, because obviously, even if we don't have it in our standard work, many Christians do. Hmm. And it can even help us in our interactions with fellow Christians that we're not so ignorant of if they suddenly mention Tobit or something, then we can, you know, be on the same page. Uh, with them, or like I said, going to museums and art um, can be more enriching because we'll recognize, oh, this is that story, or this is that episode of that story, and so forth. So, I don't know, I think there's a lot of benefits that can come from it. We shouldn't be scared about, you know, it's, there's nothing in there that's going to tear away, at, you know, any of our core doctrines or, or anything. Uh, these are people who are trying to maintain their faith to God and maintain their covenants to God in the face of a lot of trials and sometimes severe persecution. And again, I think that's why the early Latter-day Saints maybe went to the Apocrypha a little bit more because they were under severe persecution and saw some applicability uh, from those experiences. So hopefully we can, you know, read it, and through the Spirit, find some inspiration and, and uh, help in, in our own spirituality. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Jared. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. It's been really enjoyable. Um, and your voice is a very calming voice as well, which helps on a podcast, uh, learning about these things. Um, uh, it's been my pleasure, and hopefully I haven't put everybody to sleep. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time, Jared. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel, and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.